Do you want to go ahead and you want to levy fees on your players? Well, then maybe consumers will pick any of the other operators that maybe aren't doing that. You've now created an opening because lawmakers are like, look, you either play by our rules or get out. The Business of Betting podcast is presented by Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming industry. Four out of the top five U.S. operators personalize player experiences with Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming industry. Learn more about Optimove by requesting a demo at optimove.com slash business of betting. And if you like what you see, you will get your first month free. What is up, everybody? I am Jason Tros, the host of the Business of Betting podcast. I am joined today with a special episode with Joe and Dustin, and we are going to dive deep into the controversy that DraftKings kicked up this week. So we're recording this August 5th. Earlier this month, DraftKings put out an announcement that they are adding winning surcharge, I think is what they're calling it, to certain states that have over a 20% tax rate. These namely affect the states of currently right now, of New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Illinois. Pennsylvania has a tax rate of 36%, Vermont 51%, New York 51%, and Illinois tops out at 40%. So what DraftKings is essentially saying is that if a customer wins money, they're going to tax the difference over 20%. So if, if New York is 51% and they're saying we're going to surcharge you over 20%, they're going to, from my perspective, it's been it's a, a very interesting announcement, and I'm very curious to get the panel's thoughts on it today. The stock market doesn't like it very much. Uh, year to date, the DraftKings stock is down 12%. Uh, for comparison, the S&P 500 is up 8.5%. So they're not doing too well compared to the S&P 500. And I'm curious what the panel thinks about all of this. So why don't I hand it over to you guys? So what do you make of this? I'm going to be the positive one next to Joe. I think <laughs> I'm always the pessimistic one. Joe's going to just hammer it, I'm sure. I, I can at least have a pragmatic approach to it. I think it's a bad idea. But at the end of the day, DraftKings thinks they're going to make more money at this. Is that likely? Uh, probably. But I think there's a whole lot of reasons that it's a very bad idea from a lot of different standpoints that we'll probably get into here. Um, I'll, so I'll tee it up to Joe. Joe, tell us why this is such an awful idea. First of all, I really hate being characterized as a pessimist since I think I've proven since November 2008 that I'm the ultimate optimist in this industry. I, whether it's a bad idea for DraftKings is almost besides the point. It's, is it a good idea or a bad idea for the industry on both the how to mitigate the rising tide of GGR tax rates? And then also, is this, because I, you hear so many analysts say, ah, American betters, they don't really care about uh, price. They're brand loyal. They're not price sensitive. Is this something that maybe is like the first rock down the mountain face that starts the avalanche where people do become more price sensitive. It's far too early to tell that, but you could certainly game out a scenario where it could be. The price sensitivity is where I come at this too. I think Americans aren't very price sensitive. I am a casual better. As long as I'm not getting minus 120 bill sides, I don't care. Uh, I just want to bet. I only have one uh, sports book. It happens to be DraftKings here in Oregon that's legal and regulated. But I think a lot of the discussion has been around CEO Jason Robbins said, hey, this is just like we're passing on fees like a hotel, like Uber, like the stuff at the end of your restaurant receipt. And I come at it, I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same. One, one of the reasons which has been discussed on Twitter is the product is literally money that you're winning. The sports betting is fun, yes, but the, the reason you do it is because there's money involved, right? You don't do it just for no other reason. If I'm getting, every time I'm placing a bet in Illinois, New York, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm seeing something that says, oh, by the way, I'm taking this much money out of your winning bet. That doesn't feel the same to me. That feels pretty aggressive. And I feel like it is, like you said, the first rock down the mountain where if somebody's like not price sensitive, they're saying, they start scratching their head, like, wait a second, why am I not winning as much money as I should be because of this, this surcharge? And can I do that, not do that somewhere else? That's, I think that's a start of something. I don't know why DraftKings is not goose to VIG and start doing 112, 113, 115. I don't think anybody would care about that or notice. They also say it's being transparent. Is that true? Maybe not, but you're not being transparent about the other things that you're like about the VIG and where the money is going. So you're like, okay, I'm being transparent about this one thing, but I don't know. It, it does feel like maybe it like leads to a change in consumer behavior, which I think would be a, probably a pretty bad outcome for DraftKings in, in that standpoint and good for sportsbooks like yours. Yeah, I do think 
an operation like ours, this is a moment that we should be taking advantage of. Jason and Smarkets, they also are competing on margins, lower overrounds. That's an opportunity for them to find things as well. But another thing that's crept into the conversation here, and God love Americans and their conspiracy theories. It's amazing how they could take like dim thinking and elevate it to the level of three-dimensional chess and that, okay, this is a way of firing a warning shot across the bow of state lawmakers when it comes to, to rising tax rates. We're going to back you off or, or this is what we're going to do to your state residents. If that's really what they're doing, then that is the dumbest goddamn move I think I've seen yet out of these guys. And that it, that goes alongside the in colossally historically dumb move that the Fan Kings cartel kind of dropped on the entire industry, which was accepting 51%. Uh, GGR rate in New York. I don't know how on earth they thought that would be contained to New York. It reminds me of that scene from Hunt for Red October when the Soviet sub-captain fires off his torpedo without any safeties on it. In the end, he winds up blowing himself out of the water with his own goddamn torpedo. This is what they have done by normalizing that tax rate because there's no state that sits back and says, that's New York. They're better than us. There's no state that says that. New York can justify that. That's how big they are. And that's why you have everyone from Maryland to Arkansas to Vermont and others that are considering these colossally high tax rates. All they got to do is go to the click file and see the quotes from Jason Robbins and, and everybody else in the industry who bid on that and say, oh, yeah, we feel confident we can do this. And then the, the pathetic, like, come back a year later and say, oh, we were really... We didn't know what we were getting into. Okay, where are you at now? You're proposing this as tax relief, not for the players, but for yourself, the for-profit entity that said that they that agreed that they would do business at this level. And so the consumer doesn't see any of that. What's the lawmaker's motivation in any state to make it easier on you rather than easier on their citizens? You want to go ahead and you want to levy fees on your players? Then maybe consumers will pick any of the other operators that maybe aren't doing that. You've now created an opening because lawmakers are like, look, you either play by our rules or get out. Zooming out, one of the interesting thing with me was that struck me was that betting exchanges famously have a commission attached to it. And when everybody's comparing betting exchanges to uh, sports books, one of the first things they mention is there's no commission on sports books and there's a commission on, on betting exchanges. And here's an example of a, a sports book adding a commission for various reasons. And it's everything's becoming one. Smarkets is becoming more of a sports book. A sports book is becoming more of an exchange and everything's merging together. My, my initial read of what's going on and having read the hot takes on Twitter and listening to you guys is that it's basically a play to make the stock profitable. I think it's no secret that Jason's pretty obsessed with the stock price. He's tweeted about it. He seems to talk about it a lot. And it feels like a kind of a corporate way to try to prop up the stock price. And the stock price has been suffering vis-a-vis -vis the, the S&P 500. And everything is predicated upon future profit coming down the pike. And so he needs to put things in place where he can go to the street and, be, and have a credible story for where the money is going to come from. And this is, I think, working towards that. To me, the tax is ridiculous. Uh, for comparison, we pay 15% tax in the UK and we pay 5% tax in Malta. Um, off the top of my head, I want to say Ireland's 10%, something like that. But that 5 to 15% or even up to 20% is the industry standard. And for those of you that uh, don't run sports betting companies, the way the tax works is sports betting companies have to pay corporate tax like all other companies. So you have to pay wherever you're based, you have to pay your corporate tax. This tax that we're talking about is industry-specific tax. So basically it means that for every $100 the operator makes, that tax goes to whatever jurisdiction the sports bet came from. So if I make $100 as a sports betting operator in the UK, I have to pay $15 to the UK government. And in this case, in New York, if I make $100, I have to pay $51 to the operator. And that's before any other things. That's before I pay my rent. That's before I pay my staff. That's before I pay my royalty fees. And I think part of these operators have gotten over their skis a little bit in terms of all of the indirect to indirect costs that they have, the marginal cost of serving these customers. And I heard from one betting executive, and I doubt it, and it's an exaggeration, where he said that they lost money every time they took a bet in New York. Because after you add the tax and the rev share and the geolocation fees and the payment fees and the bonuses, there's no money left. So I think in some cases, these operators actually want to disincentivize taking bets in these high tax jurisdictions because on a marginal basis, on a per bet basis, they're losing money over and over again. 
I also saw a hot take on Twitter, which I also thought was interesting, that these, the quote-unquote dumb money, the recreational money that could give two shits what, they're, what odds they're paying will be fine and they'll keep on trucking. And then the slightly price-sensitive ones are the sort of sharp ones, although I imagine most of the sharp ones have been kicked out already. But if there are sharp ones that haven't been kicked out, they might uh, go over to another operator. So it might be a net positive for them. Uh, on the flip side, I do think that there is a huge... To Dustin's point, I think, and, and Joe's point, I think a lot of sports bettors aren't aware of price and people don't know the difference between minus 110 and minus 113. And that by drawing attention to the fact that there's going to be this additional uh, fee on the top, it's going to draw attention to the fact that there is difference in price and there are differences available to the consumer. I was also reading through the quarterly results, which just came out, and they talk about adjusted EBITDA. And I, I pulled up the definition of adjusted EBITDA, which is the standard definition minus stock-based compensation, which is very expensive for a lot of companies, transaction-related costs, litigation, settlement-related costs, advocacy, and other related legal expenses, gain or loss on remeasurement of warrant liabilities, and other non-recurring and non-operating costs or income. DraftKings is not the only company that talks about adjusted EBITDA, but... I think it's a, a standard tactic to draw attention away from the fact that they're not profitable. They're not close to being profitable. And the only way that they can be profitable looking forward is with a giant asterisk next to it saying we're going to adjust it to make the numbers look good. So th that's sort of my take that this is kind of not stock market manipulation, but more like stock market investment, Wall Street analyst, professional management of the company to try to uh, affect their bottom line. Well, when you consider that at the same time that they were doing this, they're announcing that the board had authorized a billion dollars in debt to do a, a stock buyback. They were obviously hoping that the street would gravitate to that message over this message and that that would be reflected in the price because that's what always happens. The company announces a stock buyback. Everybody goes out there, goes on a shopping spree so that they can benefit from that. And so far, the results have not been good. If you look, I'm looking at Bloomberg right now. When you look at the last week, they have, and of you always got to, they always frame the graphs on Bloomberg. So if you drop the 2%, it looks like you're at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but it is quite a substantial drop. A week ago, they were peaked at uh, 37. They're now approaching the 31. They're at 3102 right now. So just intraday, they're already down. Yeah, 3% intraday. So yeah, I guess the buyback thing didn't get everybody's eye. <laughs> They have debt on their balance sheet, I believe, already. And if they're not profitable, I don't know how that they're going to surface their debt. So I was, I didn't have a chance to look into the, the mechanics of, of where that money comes from. But it seemed like a crazy thing to suggest for a non-profitable company with an uncertain future to becoming profitable to be uh, issuing a buyback. Also, when, the, when you could argue that the stock is already pretty punchy, it's quite a multiple on you know, forward-looking revenue and, and just based on this presumption of profitability that may not come. I mean, there's so much game theory, I think, in everything that's going on here. Like, the bottom line is, like, we're talking about what's best for the sports betting industry. Like, DraftKings, from its standpoint, is trying to make more money. I think we all understand that. They're, we're, they're a publicly traded company doing the best for their shareholders. If this makes them more money from a very bottom line standpoint, I guess that's a good idea for them. Is that what's going to end up happening? Because there's a lot of, I think there's so much around it is, one, is anybody else going to follow them into this? If everyone follows them into this, then it's a great idea. Although we saw one smaller operator, Drush Street, Bet Rivers brand, literally put out a press release saying they're not going to do surcharges in these markets, which is interesting to use that as a point of differentiation. Will anybody else do that? It will be interesting to see. But if DraftKings is on an island, I think that's a little bit more fraught with peril and risk to them in that they're giving uh, their opponents uh, in the market a point of differentiation. Is that good? Maybe not. Is it's so much tied into do people care? P if, if people don't leave, then they should absolutely be doing a surcharge. If they really think nobody cares, like we just add money. I don't know what the tip, there's a tipping point there. Like they're saying like 3% and to a winning bet on in Illinois. What's the amount of that? And do they continue doing this in other markets, whether there's a, a high tax rate or not? Because again, if all of, if they're right on this, then absolutely should everybody should be adding a surcharge. And I, who are we to say not? And I don't know. It's, it'll be fascinating to see because we'll eventually see whether it works out or not. Even if there is attrition, they might make more money. Now, is that attrition good in the long term in terms of they've spent all this money to acquire customers and they're, they're going to punt some of them? There's going to be some attrition. Is it enough to 
to offset all the tax, who the surcharge, who knows. But it's fascinating to me from that standpoint, because we'll see, maybe not in real time, but in eventually whether this strategy works or not in, in the numbers and where people are betting and how much revenue is being generated. One thing I think is interesting is how this is going to affect their different cohorts. The only cohort that anybody's really talking about generally are like super squares, recreational betters, and then sharp betters who are price sensitive. And with the assumption being like, well, the sharps, they're just, they and their beards acting on their behalf are going to withdraw from DraftKings and find life elsewhere. And that the bumpkins who are doing SGPs, betting a toothpick to win a lumber yard, they're just going to keep on rolling the way they do. But we know that, and I know this from personal, I'm sure Jason does as well. Like the guys who really move the needle for you are your VIPs and they're all little deal makers. They come in, they know what everybody else is offering. They've gone to every sports book. They've all fluffed their pillows and given them chocolates and things like that. And that's all they want to hear from you. And I want to see if I was a VIP right now, I'd be saying like, there's no way I'm going to pay that. Well, they're probably going to waive it for the VIP. Yeah. You're like, you're either going to waive it for your VIPs or you're going to have to rebate it back to them. Okay. And because if I, that's what I would be demanding if I was somebody bringing that kind of volume to those guys. And that is their profitability or at least potential profitability right there. If they are reluctant to do that or somehow make good on that. And there's also, look, there's tax implications. Just saying like, I will give them a bunch of bonus money. They're paying the taxes on that as well. So the, the states don't recognize the difference between bonus money and actual cash. When it's bet, it's give us our give us our GGR tax. And if that's the case, what's the surcharge on that as well? So there, this is not an easy out. And I think it trips them up really big with the guys who are driving their potential profitability in that VIP cohort. Yeah, my, my guess is that they'll waive the fee for the the super customers that they they, they rely on and they'll, they'll find some way to do that. Um, but minor point, but interesting uh, intellectual thought is that the they're charging the people when they win the bet, but they actually pay the tax when people lose their bet because DraftKings is winning their bet. So they really should be charging a tax surcharge on the people who are losing their bet, but they're not doing that. So even though that they're framing this as if they were passing on the tax that they have to pay, they're doing it on the wrong set of customers. That's an excellent point. Yeah. But it also, it's a tacit admission that for, for all, and we can talk about product, which is something that Rob, Jason Robbins has couches and he's people pay a little more for better product, right? Uh, and we got to get into the finding what is actual product. And Dustin alluded to this earlier. I know Alan Bolden really hit it on the nose. When in his comments over the weekend, it's like the product is we sell bets. Okay. When you think about these things, it, one of the things I think is really interesting is before there was less of a product discussion, there's less of a side by side comparison, and people were less sensitive to, okay, primes at minus one, people are laying 108 on prime, main markets, people are laying 110, markets go as high as 115, 117 at openers, even 120 at openers people aren't moving, which is why then you have all the analysts out there saying, oh, American customers, they're just not price sensitive. They're not, that, that's not what they're, why would you force that discussion now by, because people ask like, well, why don't you just bake it into your odds? Why, why have a line item on a slip saying we're penalizing you for being a winner? Cause that's what it is. Why not just tack that additional bit into the vague? And it's essentially an admission that the odds and the price do matter. Because that would have been the that would have the that would have been the path of least resistance. This is the most visible way to do it. I give Jason credit. Guy's got some brass balls on him. He could hang outside a porn shop doing it this visibly. And when he's doing it, I guess they have just manifest confidence in themselves as a product in the marketplace and that they are they are a better product. I guess they've never heard of FanDuel who's eating their lunch on product, but that's another podcast. Yeah, I give them props for transparency and for making a bold call. Like, that's pretty cool. And to Dustin's point, like, I, I don't knock them for trying to make a buck. That's the whole point of a, of a limited company. But I, I do think, I think it's going to bite them in the ass. I think they'll probably end up canceling it for various reasons. That's my prediction that this won't hit the ticket or go live in January. But we'll see. And on the hunt for profit, we'll see what else they come up with. In terms of price, I kind of disagree with the sentiment that price doesn't matter. I do think the reason price 
hasn't mattered to date is it's really hard to do price comparison short of going to an odds comparison website and fiddling around it's quite of a quite a faff and i think if anybody figures out how to make price comparison more front easy to wrap your head around i think price will matter more and more but right now it hasn't because everybody ends up having a very similar price and and it's a pain to compare but we'll see that's we the are, point though is that it's they're giving they're putting a dollar amount on every bet when you win that's totally different to me i i know prices matter like i but i'm just i'm not going to I also don't have a choice unless I'm going to offshore. But if you put, I'm going to bet $100 and you're taking some dollars out of that rather than spreading a 110 or a 112 line, like that's, again, feels fundamentally different to me. And that's the calculation is whether is that different or not. And I think it's different. <laughs> I think, if you look at the earnings presentation, they have this little, the little graphic of what it looks like when you bet. And it's here's your bet when you win. And then, oh, we're taking, by the way, we're taking this amount out as well. That feels like reaching into my pocketbook and taking money out. And again, they're comparing it to receipts and things like that. And we've been normalized to it on a hotel bill and everything else. But when you have a, a sports bet and you're like used to seeing, oh, here's much how much I win. And oh, by the way, right here underneath, we're also going to take this amount away. That feels like a wholly different experience to me in terms of that. And it's much different than like odd shopping and, and like getting a bet like a, a 110 or a 112 line versus somewhere else or a 115 in game, which is a standard mostly. I don't, it just feels different to me. And again, we'll be proven right or wrong, whether it matters if they go through with it. I, I just don't buy this comp that it's Uber or it's a hotel resort fee or something like it. It doesn't, I don't yeah, buy and that. You could argue they, they did this at the wrong end of that wave. They're, the backlash has started on, on that, over tipping, all those things. You have getting, a, getting rid of junk fees is one of the national party, it's in their campaign platform for the presidency is getting rid of junk fees. Airbnb is a great example. Here's a backlash, I think, against Airbnb right now because of, oh, here's, you're buying a room, it's this much per night. But by the way, when you click buy, here's all the other stuff you have. You have to pay for the cleaning fee, hot tub cleaning fee. My dog, my do you know, I have a pet and you have to pay for... You have to pay for twice as many things. Those like, people are getting tired of that. People are tired of resort fees being added on, which are, are nonsense too. I. Like it is, it does feel like a weird time to say, oh, this is the same as all these other things when there is, I mean, at least this is very anecdotal, but yeah, there, there's some backlash against that. Great. My prediction is there, this is a trial balloon and they're going to can it before January. Do you guys want to put any hot takes on the record and, and see how you do in a couple of months? I don't know. I like, I feel like they've, they spent a lot of time thinking about it and they're going to go through with it at this point. I think that's the part that's fraught though. If you do go through with it and you lose customers, like, man, that's a pretty bad outcome. I guess, again, it's, it'll be borne out. I think they're going to do it. I think it's a bad idea, but I think they go through with it at this point. I, like, there's a lot, of, a lot of analysts weighed in, and it was actually not entirely negative. Again, they're looking at, oh, we think they're going to make more money. Great. And part of the calculus here is, again, and Joe knows as well as I do, that they've been carried, everybody's been carried by market launches, and market launches are toast. You have to find other ways to, to make money and be profitable. And if you're not stealing market share from somebody else, then you have to find other creative ways to do it. And surcharge is one of the, those ways to do it. So I think they're going to do I think they're going to go through with it. It could be very bad or very good for them. Again, I'm on the side that's going to be bad for them long term. It'll. I, I've bet against DraftKings many times, and I've been wrong. Not actually bet against them, but I've said they're wrong, and they've been right more times than they've been wrong over to, to date. And we'll see what happens. No, my take on this one is it won't happen in January, because could you imagine doing that price hike? right ahead of NFL playoffs, NCAA college football championships, all that, and you practically you could practically start making the ad campaign for FanDuel and Fanatics and the other guys right now. To like, hey, Illinois, New York, for Vermont. <laughs> I love that Vermont's part of the discussion here. No offense, guys. Love your maple syrup. But I, I think there might be a delay for the, the practicality around that. But they certainly gave themselves long enough runway to, to back out of it, to gauge how the market reacts to it. Jason Robbins said himself, this should be a warning to state lawmakers. And obviously I'm paraphrasing. He didn't say anything as bold as that, but that's essentially what he said. A warning to state lawmakers that this is going to be what your people will be facing if you continue to raise taxes on us. In the end, I don't know how, because this is all based on narrative. DraftKings right now, their stock price, everything, everything's based on narrative float. Dustin's right. There's always the narrative of there's always tomorrow, Texas, California. That's so far on the horizon, if it's even appearing, that it, it can't buoy their stock price right now. They can't get anything out of that. It, Dustin's right. They have to find greater market share. And they're doing it at a time when you have a companies 
ESPN bet pen. They're going to fire it up now that it's going to be football season. The fact that they're adjacent to content, more adjacent to content, at least gives them the potential for doing well. I know Dustin's thought on this, but it gives them the potential. Same with Fanatics because of their adjacency and they're in every licensing deal that's on out there. And they're, they are going to spend the money uh, to try and become part of this. The casino companies, yeah, maybe less so. Uh, and FanDuel, I mean, if I was FanDuel, because they have the rest of the world operation to backstop all of their moves here in the United States, they could decide to just, we're going to triple down on this thing and we're going to put their lights out. The one thing I don't think that you'll see is FanDuel, because people are like, oh, they must have, somehow FanDuel must be on board with this and MGM must be on board with this. He, there's no way he would step out on a plank. DraftKings would step out on a plank by themselves to do this. And I'd say, if that's what you think, I don't think you're looking far enough back into the the company's history. Remember that at one point, they were going to merge back when it was just DFS, and the FTC blew that out of the water for it being anti-competitive. There's got to be at least some cultural memory left on the boards of those two companies to know we do not want to go down that road. That is a big problem. They might want federal regulation so that they could open up their markets more. They don't want that level of federal intrusion. So I don't know. This is going to be a rocky road and having five months to punch up on it will be great. There's got to be at least somebody in the council's office on the board and up that will be the wise old head, speaking for the gray hair crowd, that's going to say, you are now trying to be too clever by half. You were too clever by half and agreeing to 51% in New York, thinking that the economics would box out competition. And so you'd have this duopoly because they could afford the costs. But by being so clever, then you've essentially ignited the forest fire that's going to burn down both of your houses, unless you somehow find a way to get this back in there. And that's what they're going to have to do. Their narrative right now should be focused on the states, state houses, state legislatures, on how to turn back the tide on the rising tax bills. Wall Street, they'll take care of themselves in due time. But if they do not take care of the problem in the state houses, it's going to be very difficult for them and for the industry, frankly. Great. Thanks very much, Joe and Dustin, for stopping by. Here's your podcast hot take on, in audio form. Instead of going on Twitter and talking about this, we decided to jump on a podcast. So. Thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy your summer. Hopefully, we'll be back to a regular schedule soon and uh, take it easy. The Business of Betting podcast is presented by Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming industry. Four out of the top five U.S. operators personalize player experiences with Optimove, the number one CRM marketing solution for the iGaming industry. Learn more about Optimove by requesting a demo at optimove.com slash business of betting. And if you like what you see, you will get your first month free.